We've come. We've come to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Oh yes, we've come. Oh yes, we've come to give Him praise. To give Him praise. We've come. We've come to give Him the honor. To give Him the honor. Let's magnify Him. Let's magnify Him. All of our ways. In all of our ways. Who are we? We're interceding, Christian Center. We hope that you felt welcome. From the time that you entered into the house of the Lord. Come. God bless you. Once again, Dr. Schaefer, the pastor of Interceding Christian Center. To God Almighty be the glory. Before we get into this great message, what I want you to do is I want you to go down on your screen and press on this side the like button. And then on this side of your screen, press the subscribe button. Amen. Let's go into talk about this word the Lord gave me. He dropped into my spirit. Just this week, the Lord talked to me about position and placement and the connection between position or placement and your blessings. There's truly a connection between them. There are many examples in the Bible that shows us there's a connection between position or your placement and your blessing. And by position, I mean self-positioning and your blessings. But never mind. Let's go into the sanctuary here with us said the Lord. Amen. The scripture is found in the 27th chapter of Genesis. The 27th chapter of Genesis. And we're going to verse 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, oh, he called, so dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and take me some venison. And make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah, Heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. That's good food, y'all, venison. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Amen, amen. That's better than hogmogs and grits, amen. That's a good food. That's better than grits and, well, I don't know, amen. Uh, and Rebecca spake unto Jacob, her other son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, he didn't say it out loud because you know, his eyes were dim, but he still could hear. Amen. Amen. So she basically whispered into the ear of her other son, Jacob, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, that brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now, therefore, my son, she's speaking to Jacob, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. She's conniving. Go now to the flock and fetch me from hence two good kids of the goats. And I will make them savory meat for thy father such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father and he may eat that he may bless thee before his death. Let us pray. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, we give you glory, praise, and honor. We thank you right now for your mercy and your grace. We ask, Lord God, you would bless the word that would have come forth from my mouth, Lord God, with conviction, hallelujah, as well as conviction, convincing, Lord God, for a change to come in the lives of your people. Now, we thank you in advance for what you've already done. We bind up anything that's not like you, anything that will cause distraction, anything that will cause, Lord God, your children to not hear your voice through me, Father God. We bind it up right now by the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and we stand together and say, Amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless the name of our God on today. We give him reverence and praise. Hallelujah. For all that he has done. Amen. Coming straight forward from 
the book of the Lord in Genesis, I want to give you a title. I want to minister to you. And I, I don't want, I don't want to, to minister in a way where you're just totally uh, uh, blown away because that doesn't matter when you're blown away. The, what matters to me is if you would make forth an effort to change. Make forth an effort to change. How many know that God desires to bless each and every one of us beyond our wildest imagination? He desires to bless us so much that it will cause the eyes to sting of those who, who hate you. It will to cause the ears of those who hate you to, to, to hate to hear your name called. God wants to bless you that much. Now when I'm speaking to you, I'm not speaking to you from a gospel of prosperity. And the gospel of prosperity really how, uh, will have you believe that you can just be mediocre to God and get anything. Would have you believe that God is like a genie in a bottle and you rub that bottle and he pops up and gives you what you want. But to get what God has for you, you have to learn the nature of God. And you have to love the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your, what, your own understanding. You have to want what it is that God wants for you. And what God wants for you more than anything is obedience. And God doesn't want you to love the gift more than the gift giver. He doesn't want you to be more concerned about what you have versus what he is and who he is in your life. In this story, we find a man named Esau. We find also a man named Jacob who were twins. And we find their mother whose name was Rebecca. And Rebecca was being conniving and she was trying to convince the younger son whom she favored. She favored this younger son. And this is something that parents need to take a lesson from. Don't favor your children. Don't show favoritism to your children. Even the great man Jacob eventually showed favor when he became Israel. He showed favor. You cannot show favor to your children. But in this storyline, what we found out was that Rebecca was trying to get her younger son to receive the blessing that the father was going to pray upon him. The father Jacob asked for something simple. He said, I want some wild game. That's what he said. I want some wild game. I don't want nothing domestic. I don't want nothing you can go and pull up out of the refrigerator or the freezer. I don't want nothing you can go and buy at Popeye's, in other words. I don't want nothing that, that is just, I want something with a wild flavor to it. Huh? But Rebecca heard she was ear hustling. She heard what was said. And she wanted her son, Jacob, to get the blessing. We're going to get into this in a minute. I'm going to come back to them and talk about them some more. But I want to talk to you from a, something that you can really understand. Something that most should understand in terms of modern terminology and language. Something that you should understand. There's a term in real estate that speaks to the value of property, not just short term, but long term. It speaks to its value. And that phrase is three words and it's all the same word. Location, location, location. Location, location, location. Oh, you may say, I don't understand the importance of location, but there's a story about a man in North Carolina who was a young farmer at the turn of the 20th century that went off from his family and bought himself a plot of land. And when he bought himself this plot of land, he, he eventually had children and they had great prosperity on the land. But over a time period, he lived out by himself. Everyone seemed to move into his area and began to farm as well. And as they farmed, they noticed that their, their crops were not as savory, not as abundant, not as plenteous as his crops were. But the man continued to do what he did, and he eventually raised children on his land. Somebody said, location, 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 location. He had bought his land in a place in a city that's called Chicago, Illinois. And the land was in the suburbs of Chicago that he had bought this land. And he lived in such peace on his land. He was very successful. His neighbors were not as successful. But around the same time as this man was prospering in his farming, 
In a state called North Carolina, there were two bicycle makers who were busy trying to fly. That makes sense, bikes that fly. Oval and Wilbur Wright were busy trying to get a machine to fly while they were being laughed to scorn by everyone around them. Eventually, over a time period, they figured out how to get this plane in the air. It was basically a bicycle with wings. They found out, figured out how to get this bike to fly. They figured out how to make this thing defy the laws of gravity and, and, and to beat the restriction of gravity and to lift up off the ground. They figured out how to do that. And over a very short time period, it was realized that the plane would end up being the method of transportation that people would use. Oh, it was okay to drive a car. A car was available, but a car was still a bumpy, rocky ride. A car was not as comfortable as what we have today. You didn't have power steering in cars in that day and age. Most of you couldn't even begin to drive a car from that age and that time period because it didn't necessarily even have a steering wheel. It had a rod in which you used to turn. And then the transmission, you wouldn't even have a clue how to put it in drive, let alone crank it. Huh? So this car was very uncomfortable to them. I saw something the other day that made me crack up, Sister Glory. This guy had a, a Volkswagen Beetle, and on the side he had a little symbol with a gear shift pattern on it. And he said, this is the Millennium Death Prevention Device. Because young folks can't drive sticks. Amen. You got to learn adventure, right? <laughs> Amen. But in this storyline, we found out that over a time period, we realized that flight was the direction things were going. But they realized in order to take off in a plane, they needed a massive amount of land. In order to take off and to land in a plane, they need a massive amount of land. So Chicago realized they needed an airport. So they sent surveyors out, and the surveyors found this land, which happened to be the farmer's land, it happened to be his property. And when they found his property, they said, like, this is great. And they found a property around, this is great for what we need to do. This is great for Chicago O'Hare Airport. And they went in, they bought the land. They bought all of the land, except for one piece of the land was set in the middle. One gigantic strip of the land was set in the middle. This one gigantic strip, you know, would belong to. It belonged to our friend, the farmer. They went in, they bought the land for little nothing. They, because the people were not as prosperous as this farmers were, so they bought the land for little nothing. They paid them off and they got off the land. And, but they needed this one piece of land in order to really make the airport what it was going to be. So they, they went in and they talked about it. They discussed it. One of the, one of the architects of the developers said, hey, well, I don't see how we could possibly buy this land from him because have you seen his crops on that land? Have you seen the nice house he got on it? Have you seen the farm animal? Have you seen this? And one guy said, yeah, I don't see how we could possibly buy the land from him. I don't see how we could possibly do it. And then the chief developer said, hey, what did you give the other guys? I gave such and such amount. He said, well, what did this guy ask for? Well, he didn't ask for, he didn't ask for anything. He just said, what you offered me is not enough. So he said, you go out there and you tell him whatever he wants for that land, I will give it to him. Oh, my God, my God. So, they went out and they talked to him. The lawyer talked to him and said, whatever you want from this land, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Well, the, the man thought about it. He wasn't somebody who had just fell off the turnip truck. He thought about it. He, he said, I don't want necessarily just a little bit of money because a little bit of money is going to eventually go away. He said, I don't want just this. He said, what I want is I want prosperity for my family. I want prosperity for my family. So eventually over a time period, because the developers saw the value of the land, the developer's family is still getting royalties from this land, as well as the farmer's family. Over a hundred years later, still getting it. It all started out by positioning. 
The place that he had bought that no one else wanted wouldn't grow. He, he had bought this land. It was positioning because he was positioned in the right place, in the right place at the right time. In the same token, and this is not to glorify what Jacob did. Jacob's name was Jacob the trickster. He was a one who was foolhardy. He did a lot of just trickery things. But, but, but not to glorify him, but Jacob's mother helped to position him into a place where he received the blessings of of his father. <laughs> but how many know that in this storyline, just because Jacob's father has spoke blessings over his life instead of over the life of Esau, that does not mean that that was God's perfect plan for him. Oh, it was God's intention that Jacob would be a blessing and Jacob would be blessed. It was God's intention. But how many know there are times we get in God's way? We jump the gun. Someone come in, they lay hands on you, say you're going to be the greatest prophet since, the, since sliced cheese and such and such and such. And we get all fired up and we run out there and start a storefront. We run out there and start ourselves a new place because someone said something about our life. See, they, you can be 10 years old. They say you're going to eventually be 20. Are you going to run out there at age 10 and try to be 20? You're going to wait out that time that you need to wait out in order to position yourself so you'll be able to receive the blessings that God has for you. In the same token, the children of Israel, which was Jacob later, could not take the land. They had to go into a far off land and be in slavery and wait for the blessings of God. God said that you're too small right now to, to possess this land, so I'm going to leave the evil people in this land for a time period and the evil people who are in this land are going to clear the land. They're going to grow these great crops. They're going to grow all the night, make these nice houses and gardens. They're going to do this stuff. But guess what? They're not doing it as unto their blessings. They're doing it as unto you. Because I'm going to eventually remove them from the land and let you get it. It's about positioning. It's about positioning. What I want to talk to you about positioning has to do with how you position yourself in the Lord. How you position yourself in the Lord. As I said, also it was the farmer's position that allowed him to be blessed that way. But positioning is not something that we do often enough on purpose. Sometimes we just stumble into a blessing. Have ever seen that? Like how in the world? Like this, this is this. Uh, and I know kids' minds work a little different than our mind, but. I'm trying to figure out blues clues. How did that get me? Just that, that doesn't make sense. How did it get me? Then the kids were watching some this morning. And I was like, they get paid to do that. And Yana said, of course, yeah, they are Paul I said, wow. But positioning, sometimes we find ourselves stumbling into a position, but we got to work not to just stumble into position. We got to work so that we'll be in the position in order to get the blessing. By position, I'm not talking about just your physical location. Because you can be broke, but have a good heart, a spirit-filled heart, a heart that's open for God's blessing. You can be broke and have these things. Oh, you could easily be that, but, but you can also be well to do. Well to do. I was talking to someone, and she was one of my grandkids, because they had talked to me a lot, believe it or not. I was talking to her, and, and they mentioned Michael Jackson. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, Michael Jackson, we know him. I said, boy, he was one of the greatest dancers in the world, such and such, and he was a great singer. And then I started doing the thriller thing, and they began to laugh, like, please don't do that. Huh? And I talked about it, and, and I said, well, he died. And he said, how did he die? I said, well, you know, you know, he had money. He had fame. He couldn't walk outside without people like, hey, boy, no! Could nobody do any dance without somebody trying to compare him to Michael Jackson? I think MC Hammer even had a contest. Like, oh, uh -uh, I can dance better than Michael Jackson. He had all those things that the world can give you, but one thing he didn't have, he did not have joy. He did not have peace. He did not have these things that are free to us. 
In the same token, there's a lot of people out there in Holly Spear, in other places, Nashville, wherever these musicians and, and actors and actresses uh, are at, they can be on the Chateau of Spain or wherever they may be at. And they're not even happy. Because happiness is not a physical location. Happiness is a spiritual location. Oh, God. It's a spiritual thing. Your joy is not contained within the physical things that you can amass. You can amass great fortune, but then again, you can walk out of trap because you're not happy. You're not happy. It is not those things that make you happy because, you know, your, your happiness is not dependent upon those things. Your happiness is dependent upon the position that you are in the Lord. Positioning in your walk of faith has more to do with your heart than your physical location. You've got to have a spiritual relationship with God. Huh? As I said, you can have all kinds of material things, but have not an ounce of joy. Have not joy. Huh? Have not joy. This is shown in the story of the King Midas. Anybody know the story of King Midas? King Midas had so much gold and riches and wealth, and he had all these things. Uh, he had all these things, but he also had a daughter that he cherished. But King Midas turned around, and I know this is a fairy tale, but this is so applicable to what I'm talking about. That King Midas turned around and he, he said, I want the golden touch. Huh? And I think y'all know the rest of it. Everything he touched turned to gold. I know that's an old song back in the day. He wanted the gold to touch. Everything that he did, he wanted to turn to gold. So he asked for this and he got the gold to touch. So he walked around in rooms and he touched things and everything turned to gold. Everything he touched turned to gold. The pillar, the pulpit, everything turned to gold. As he touched the fruit, everything turned to gold. But as he was walking around touching things, they turned to gold. His daughter walked up to him and she called him daddy. And he turned around and his love for her was so great that he touched her and she turned into gold. Gold is cold. Gold is, is just that. The only reason gold has any value is because people like the look of it and it values itself that way. But gold means absolutely nothing and I'm sure King Midas in his story you know, it's a fairy tale in his story. Realize that the golden touch didn't mean absolutely nothing. <coughs> but his daughter fell victim to this because of how he positioned his heart. And because she loved her father, she became gold. So you're in your positioning yourself. You have to ultimately know that it's your relationship with God that matters in the great end. You can position yourself in many ways. Ways that are important and ways that are not important. You can position yourself to be a member of Congress and not be of any effect at all. You can position yourself, but, but the thing about positioning yourself, you have to understand the power that the tongue plays in positioning. The tongue is like you're, you're a big old ship, you're an oversized ocean liner, and, and, and the tongue is your rudder. It's the one thing that turns that ship to go to one direction or another. If you open your mouth and say certain things out of your mouth, you can cause yourself to be blessed or you can cause yourself to be cursed. Hallelujah. Everybody with me? Let me hear an amen there if you're with me. Amen, amen, amen. Speaking of positionings, the most important position we can have is our position in Christ. Christ holds the highest position as God exalted his name above each and every name. And because he died for us, uh, and when we accept him as our Lord, we're given the position power that a family member would have. What's position power of a family member? A family member who know he has position power walks into the house because he has a key to the door. He has a combination of the lock or whatever. He walks into the house. He may or may not say hi. He may say, well, I got to run and go and take care of what. He may do that, but a family member knows that he has the authority to walk in and go in the refrigerator and get that his food. It's position power. It's position power. It's position power. In the same token, because we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ, we are in position power. This is what God wants. He wants us to be in position power. Hallelujah. I was 
one position himself with God. It's simple. It's obedience. That's the hardest thing for folks, obedience. Listening, obeying his voice, reverencing him, glorifying him, thanking him, being, 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 being conscious of who God is. Huh? Being conscious of who God is. And, and, and I'm real big about being conscious of the presence of God. I'm real big about being conscious of who God is and that God is omnipotent, omnipresent. I'm real conscious about the thing. So therefore, I'm very, uh, I'm very, what's the word? Uh, I'm very, very, uh, my, thought, my thoughts are like, I got to make sure I'm doing something that's glorifying God. So because I'm so conscious of God's presence. And because I'm conscious of his presence, it makes me conscious of my position in him. I didn't get blessings just because I'm handsome. Whew. And I know I am handsome. Hey, Amen. Thank you, son. I didn't get blessings just because of that. There were, there were things I had to go through. And the same thing with you. You have to go through certain things to get the blessings that you need to get from God. God is not just going to give you things because he's just like, oh, okay, uh, first pour my hand. Oh, you got three grades. No, that, that's not God. God is looking for the obedience of your heart. He's looking for the obedience of your, your actions to determine how he's going to bless you, where he's going to bless you. See, God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you real good. <laughs> he wants to bless your socks off. He does. But God is not going to pour his blessings into foolishness. There are certain natural laws that we know are in place. Whereas if someone follows a natural law that God has set forth, they can have all kinds of wealth. But just because they're following a the natural law, because a natural law is what it is. I open my mouth, I breathe, I get oxygen. I open my nose, I breathe, I get oxygen. Everybody applicable to that natural law. If I walk off the porch and, and miss a step, I roll down the stairs. Huh? That's a natural law. It's gravity. It's a natural law. Everyone, it, uh, a natural law is applicable to everyone. But God wants you to be, allow spiritual laws to be applicable to you. Because you can have all the wealth in the world, the natural laws can give you based on that, but you have not one tensy, wincy, incy, bincy bit of joy. Huh? Not, not none whatsoever, none whatsoever. In our scripture today, we find Jacob, though, in a very precarious situation. I want to recap this. Jacob, being a man who was called a trickster because he was born a twin, his brother, his brother Esau was the first one born, but he, they were not identical twins. They were, what's the other word for twins they have? Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, he was not an identical twin. Uh, Jacob, Jacob came out and he was smooth. It's like Esau got all the hair or something. You know how it is sometimes when you're dealing with twins. One comes out and they just real big and buff. The other one comes out like a little bitty splinter. Huh? Jacob was one who came out and his mother favored Jacob because Jacob was one who stayed in the house all in the mother's apron string. But Esau was a man, a man's man. He got out there rugged and rough and tough. He went out there and he killed and took what he needed, huh? His father favored him, of course, because that was masculinity. But because his mother favored Jacob, not knowing that God favored Jacob as well, she went along with a plan. He, she had him convinced him to go along with a plan. A plan trying to trick his father out of the blessing that he already had. <laughs> you ever had a child do that to you? You know you're going to give him the candy anyway. You're going to give it to him. You know you're going to give him a bag or two of candy, right, Papa? You know you're going to give it to him, but you just want to hear them talk. And they're talking, they're getting themselves deeper and deeper. They're trying to trick you out of something that you're going to give them anyway. <laughs> This is the same thing with Jacob. He was trying to trick his way into his blessings. He was trying to position himself with God, whereas God had already positioned him. God had already determined that the blessings was going to come through Israel's bloodline, which was Jacob's name later. In due time, his trickery got him tricked. He worked for 14 years to get one woman he wanted. Seven years, he got the sister. Everybody know the sister, the older sister, oh, you know, 
He didn't want to. He said, like, no, no, I didn't ask. No, no, LeBron, I didn't ask for her. Put the bell back on. Put it back in the box. No, 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 no. But he said, no, it's not done this way. You have to marry her first. So he had to work seven more years to get what he really wanted. In other words, the grand trickster got tricked. He had positioned himself to a point where he ended up being tricked. Oh, my God, my God. We have to be very careful because we can position ourselves in the same way. Or we can be tricked by what looks like gold. But just because it glitters does not mean that it is gold. Because everything that glitters is not gold. It's not gold. Somebody said positioning. Positioning. When King Jehoshaphat cried out to God, he cried out to God from a standpoint of, Lord, I've already prayed. I've already cried. I've, I've always done what I can do. I'm asking you to save us. And then an unknown priest whose name was never mentioned anymore in the Bible, a young man whose name was never mentioned, an unknown Levite said, you know, King Jehoshaphat and the rest of you folks, chill out. It's all good. God said, the battle is yours. <laughs> Not yours, but it's mine. I got this. You've already won the battle. And in positioning power, instead of putting the warriors up front, instead of putting the fierce fighting in, instead of putting the special forces, the Delta Force, the Navy SEALs up front, instead they put the Army Band up front. And they marched into battle singing praise. How many know that praise is the best weapon you can have anyway? Praise confused the enemy. Why does praise confuse the enemy? You could be broken up on the inside. You could be hurt on the inside. Everyone can seem like they have turned completely against you on the inside. But as long as you don't open your mouth or show it in your attitude or your facial expression, the enemy does not know. He does not read mine. As long as you can open your mouth and be like Job, though I've been slain, yet will I bless him, yet will I glorify him. As long as you can open your mouth and glorify God in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your tribulation, in the midst of your situation, as long as you can thank God in spite of what it is, if you can give God an inspire of praise, as long as you can do that, you can survive, you can make it through, the enemy will be totally confused because you're still worshiping and praising God. Everything he's thrown at you to include the kitchen sink, not just the kitchen sink. He went and got a pipe wrench and took apart the pipes underneath and do the pipes and the wrench at you. But yet you still thank God I praise you. God I glorify you. God I honor you. Yet you're still thanking God. Hallelujah. When God spoke to the children of Israel under King Jehoshaphat, he gave them confidence. He let them know that you have positioned yourself. Now that he say you position yourself, he said, by the way, this is where the enemy's positioned at. Huh? Oh, my God, my God, my God. Jehoshaphat had used praise to position himself with God. Nothing. God loves praise. Nothing just makes God feel so good like your praise and worship of him. Huh? You call a glory hound. God loves praise. Huh? How much does he love praise? When the disciples were with Jesus and the crowd around him, the Pharisees and the other seas, the Sadducees and the Je Jebusites and all those people around him began to say, tell the crowd to shut up. Tell them to shut up. Tell them to shut up. And the disciples and John said, tell them to shut up. Tell them to shut up. Jesus said that if I tell them to shut up, then the rocks will cry out. Rocks will cry out. In other words, the rocks will rocks will grow lungs, tongues, and everything they need in order for them to sing a praise unto God. God loves praise, and nothing positions you into a blessing like praising God. Somebody ought to praise Him right there. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but say I'm told when the praises go up, the blessings come down. Somebody ought to praise God right there. Hallelujah. Can somebody clap their hands and glorify God right there and know that you are blessed beyond your imagination? Can somebody help you position yourself into a place with God where God's going to do a great thing in your life. It does not matter that it's Sunday and every bank is closed, but God can go inside of your bank account even right now and cause you to be blessed. Hallelujah. It's something about positioning yourself with God. Well, you don't have to fight the battles anymore. 
Huh? You don't even really have to go to war anymore when you position yourself in the right way with God. God will know. He'll know your strengths. He'll know. The Bible tells us when God is for us, he's more than the world against us. He knows your strength. The Bible says that one of us can put how many in flight and two can put 10,000 in flight. God knows your strengths, but God knows his own strength. God knows that all it takes is one angel to clear the earth. God knows that. Hallelujah. All you got to do is dispatch the right angel and the earth can be cleared of everything. God knows that. In the same token, Joshua, the man who marched around Jericho for seven days, the man who marched around Jericho for seven days, hallelujah, had positioned himself in the heart of God in such a way, whereas God told him when Moses died, he said, don't worry, be strong and of good courage. My, my servant Moses is dead, but don't worry, Joshua, I got you. In the same way that the people uh, praised, uh, praised Moses, they're going to praise you the same way that they believed in what Moses could do. They're going to believe the same thing with you, Joshua. Joshua, all you got to do is be strong and encouraged because Joshua had positioned himself with God. I know a lot of times society will tell you you need to position yourself with certain people in the workplace. Yeah, in a sense that could be true. But if you position yourself with those people but you have absolutely no position power with God, then that's a problem. That's a problem. You have to position yourself with God first and foremost. That's your most important position that you can have. Oh, my God, my God, my God. Only got 30 more pages of notes. You'll be all right. Can you imagine, though, with Joshua and Sister Glory, the suspense just built up as he marched around Jericho? Because God told him, don't say nothing. Hush. Hush, don't you say nothing. Don't say nothing. Oh, my God. We wouldn't make it. We wouldn't make it if God told him, okay, don't say nothing. We wouldn't make it. We would mess up. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. You see your favorite team winning the game and winning the Super Bowl. They got 25 points more than another team that you totally despise. You, and you're like, we got, we got. you ain't going to sit there like, no, you're going to be screaming and yelling. You're going to be telling Kendrick your team going to finally lose. You know what I mean? You're going to be doing that stuff. Because we, 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 we have a hard time really being obedient to what God does. Because God even says, he said, Hold your peace. At times you tell you to hold your peace. I know people are talking about you. I know people are using you. I know people are mistreating you. I know all these things are going on, but I don't want you to say a mumbling word. Jesus, in the same token, did not say a mumbling word as he went through what he went through. He didn't say nothing because he was in position power. And see, we can move ourselves out of position power by opening up our mouths doing people wrong, say doing to them as they do unto us. No, it's not right. But we have to do what God has called us to do. And that is to position ourselves in a position of being blessed with Him. Children of God, I'm going to wrap up and talk to you some more. Hallelujah. I'm not done, but I got a lot more. It is not to impress you that I shout and glorify God. I know. And it's not to even annoy you, because I know some folks like he's just annoying. It's not. It's not to self-glorify. It's just that God has been so good to me. And God has taught me about being positioned in him. It's, 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 it's because of how praise positions you before the Lord God Almighty. God said you should enter into his gates with thanksgiving, enter into his house to pray, and you should bless his name. Not because I need, I need because it's out of obedience that I do these things under God. It's out of respect. It's out of our need that we bless God in our circumstance, in our sin. It's out of that. See, your position with God is only as strong as your praise. Oh, can, can we do something for a moment? Can everybody stand on your feet and clap your hands and shout glory, hallelujah, as loud as you can real quick. On, on the count of three, I'll keep clapping your hands and everybody stand up so much because it was on the other. On the count of three, one, two, three. Oh, come on now, you need to position yourself a little bit great with God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! My God, my God, my God. You can sit down, y'all. Hallelujah.
I told you that worship is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's not a moment in time. It's a lifestyle. A lifestyle of worship. Uh, worship is a foundation in which praise is built upon. You position yourself upon the promises of God. Uh, using praise as the weapon. As your praise of, upon worship as your foundation. All that you do in life should be a focus upon positioning yourself for God. Hallelujah. Even in the end day, at the last judgment, the great white throne judgment, uh, even at that time period, it's a matter of your positioning with God. Uh, if you position with right, he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Come stand at my right side, lamb. But if you have not done what he told you to do, you haven't even tried. You haven't accepted Jesus as your true Lord and Savior. Oh my God, my God. If you haven't accepted us, you keep going to say you depart from me. I know you're not. It's kind of an oxymoron because he knows you very well. Depart from me because you really didn't know me. You really didn't reverence me. You really didn't worship me. You really reverence and worship the things of this world. You are a goat. Go to the goat pile. It's one thing to be sent to the goat pile. That's not your final destination. That's not where you want to end up at. You're not going to end up there. Your final destination, once you get sent to the go pile, is hell eternal. It's the lake of fire. It's a place that God did not meant for anybody, meet for anybody to go to. That's your final destination. Somebody said position. Position. See, there's a connection between being, between positioning and blessings. There is connection. There is a connection. Hallelujah. When David faced Goliath, he would say, it was my position in God that I'm talking about here. It's not my height, my size. It's not, not my ability to sling this rock and bust your head. It's not that. It's my position in God. I am angry. I am upset because you have defied the God of all creation. I'm angry. I'm upset because you defied our great God. I'm angry. I'm upset because our God is good. Our God is worthy. Our God created all heaven and earth. Our God is able. How dare you defy the true and living God? It was a matter of David's position of David's heart and how he felt about God that allowed him to sling that rock at supersonic speed and bust the lies in his head. I don't know about you, but I'm going to tell you. I don't know if you know, but I'm going to tell you that you are in a great position right now. You're in a great position. Why? Pastor, how can I possibly be in a great position? Pastor, I, I ain't got no money, I ain't got no friend, I I'm, I'm like uh, the old, the old uh, boxer, I ain't got no teachers, I, I ain't got nothing going for me. I, I don't, how can I possibly be positioned? I don't have any education, I don't, how can I possibly be positioned? This is how you position. This is how you position. Because you're able to stand on your feet. Because someone did not help you to get into the door. Because you're not laying out here before me. And I'm having to pronounce words to your family to encourage them. Though you have been. Uh, then you are in a good position. That means you're in a position to start over, to start fresh, to start anew. You are in a good position. Tell your name and I'm in a good position. Oh, come on, tell, oh, that's what I'm talking about, sister. Tell your neighbor, come on, I'm really telling you. Turn and tell your brother I'm in a good position. Now you tell her you're in a good, oh, there you go, son. He did it without me even saying it, amen. You are in a good position, which means that you have a starting point. You have a location to start from. You can only go up from this position. If you want to go down, that's up to you, but I'm sorry. I don't want to hit rock bottom anymore. I want to spring from where I am and go higher in the Lord. I want to spring from where I am and go to a position where God will bless me and keep me. I want to spring from where I am. I'm I'm not going to stay where I was. I'm going to be greater in him. Greater. Say I'm greater in him. I'm greater in him. I'm greater in him. Stand on your feet. Say I am greater in him. Say I am greater because of him. I am greater 
because of him. I am greater because he paid the cost. Ah, shit, pull she. I am greater because of his blessings over my life. I am greater because he is God by himself. Hallelujah. And he has blessed me beyond my wildest imagination. I am positioned with him. I am seated in heavenly places. I'm sitting on heaven's council. I can decree. I can bind in the earth. I can loose on the earth. I am somebody in God. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. Don't ever think that you anything less than what God has said about you. Amen. Don't ever open your mouth and say that I am not that. What God has said about you, don't contradict what God has said about you. Hallelujah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper unless you position yourself to let it prosper. If you open your mouth and allow it to prosper in your life, it can't prosper. It can't prosper. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Flood the altar. Give me some music appropriate again, please. Hallelujah. I pray that you enjoyed the word today and that it touches you within a deep place in your heart and it will spark a change that should come about in your life. If the Lord so touched your heart and you have a desire to give, you can give to this ministry as we continue to make impacts in this city at our Givelify app. Simply download the Givelify app at one of the app or the Google store and look for Interceding Christian Center. Here at Interceding, we aspire to bring people to spiritual knowledge and thus victory. God bless you.